Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Uh, there have been almost 350 of them now, so uh, if you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, look under the past interviews menu, and you'll see them all archived um, in various ways. This whole production is made possible by the support of generous viewers and listeners, and so thanks to those who've been supporting it, and if you feel like being one of them, uh, there's a donate button on, and a page about donations on the website that you can check out. Um, my guest today is my friend Bernardo Kastrup. Um, I interviewed Bernardo a couple of years ago, and then we met in person out at the SAND conference this fall and had a good time. Um, I would say that if I would categorize Bernardo as a gnani, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the smartest people I know. And if anybody can get to, to enlightenment by virtue of the brilliance of their intellect, it's Bernardo. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, just, just trying to see if I can make you blush. Um, but first, let me read your formal uh, bio here so people can get to know who you are. Bernardo Castro has a PhD in computer engineering with specializations in artificial intelligence and reconfigurable computing. He has worked as a scientist in some of the world's foremost research laboratories, including the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, and the Phillips Research Laboratories, where the Casimir effect of quantum field theory was discovered. Bernardo has authored many scientific papers and philosophy books. His three most recent books are more than allegory, which is what we're going to be talking about today, um, subtitled On Religious Myth, Truth, and Belief, um, another book, Brief Peaks Beyond, and another one, Why Materialism is Baloney. He has been an entrepreneur and founder of a successful high-tech startup. Next to a managerial position in the high-tech industry, Bernardo maintains a philosophy blog, a video interview series, and continues to develop his ideas about the nature of reality. He has lived and worked in four different countries across continents, currently residing in the Netherlands. For a rigorous analytical summary of his philosophical ideas, um, you can look to, and there's a link here, which is kind of long. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the website. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Bernardo. Um, and thank you also for doing this on short notice. Uh, for those who have been listening, I had scheduled um, David Spangler this weekend, and he had a health emergency and had to postpone. So Bernardo was kind enough to do this on very short notice. So it's always fun to talk to you, so I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind that there are thousands of people watching, it's always fun to talk to you anyway. <laughs> At the moment, there's only 27, so you can relax. Mm. Yeah. More will be watching offline, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, and just to, to put a plug about where Bernardo is, he's, he's in his girlfriend's apartment in Germany, and that, that's her artwork on the wall behind him. She's <laughs> obviously a very talented artist. <clears throat> so um, why don't you get us started, Bernardo, by um, giving us just a synopsis of what your book is about that we're going to be talking about. Well, as the subtitle uh, implies, it's about a religious myth, religious mythology, which is uh, something I've had a, a bit of a schizophrenic relationship with uh, throughout my life. Um, my father was a scientist, my mother was a Roman Catholic, uh, so she had a relationship with religion and I was exposed to that as a kid. But uh, in my career as a scientist and a corporate manager, I sort of lo completely lost contact with that, neglected it completely, even disregarded it. And uh, only very recently, um, it is uh, sort of resurging in me, uh, but in a very different way than it was before. Uh, and the book is about how do you restore the legitimacy of religious myths? in a mature way that doesn't defy reason, doesn't defy logic, doesn't condone fundamentalism, but also keeps the door open for what the myths are pointing to, which are truths that transcend literal articulation, linear articulation through the rules of Aristotelian logic, transcendent truths. Do you feel that all religious myths do that, or would there be like a spectrum of, of myths, some of which uh, correlate with deeper realities and other, others of which are just sort of fanciful no so there's, a, there's a spectrum, of course. Myths is basic, are basically narratives that we tell each other, uh, metaphorical slash symbolic narratives. I'm interested in the symbolic part. Uh, but of course there is a spectrum. There are myths that are just 
preposterous. The, there are myths that, uh, that, uh, that are meant uh, to be conducive to social control, to, to, to gender repression uh, or, or the repression of whatever sexual orientation and is out there. Um, myths that are meant to, to, to help people achieve power and, 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 and money and status or whatever. So there is a spectrum. But when I talk of religious myths, I talk about those, the, the, the core of, the, that underlies the, the canon of the world's established religions and some creation myths uh, that are less well known, but the core intuitive aspect of those narratives, not the bells and whistles we've added to them uh, in the course of history for whatever egoic centered purpose, uh, but the core intuitions underlying those myths that emerge from, from deep within the human psyche, uh, those are what I call the true, authentic, legitimate uh, religious myths. And we should point out that um, myths are not the sole province of religion. For instance, in your book you talk about the myths of modern culture, um, myths of science, for instance. Here's a quote, science's blind devotion to the gods of chance and automatism condemns its myths to hollowness. So, I mean, there's a whole predominant um, scientific myth that the world is mechanistic and meaningless and, uh, you know, just a lot of little billiard balls bouncing around without any sort of divine intelligence orchestrating things. Sure, uh, not every myth is a religious myth. Not every myth is pointing to transcendent truths, pointing to things that, that, that lack in our ability to linearly articulate in words. Uh, myths in general uh, are just narratives in terms of which we can relate to the world. I mean, we are always running myths uh, in the back of our minds, constantly, because we are always interpreting sense perception. We are always interpreting what we see, what we hear, uh, what we taste, what we smell. Uh, there is a constant interpretation machine going on in the backs of our minds that inform us of the meaning and significance of what we perceive. If we didn't have this, this, this myths running in the background all the time, the world we see would be just a bunch of dancing pixels. Uh, they would evoke no, no meaning, no emotion, no significance you know, within us. It, it would mean literally nothing. Um, so myths are integral to life. The question is, uh, what myths do you run? Do you run restrictive myths that ma basically make life feel uh, dull, unimportant, and, and pointless? Or do you run rich myths that put you in contact with aspects of your own psyche, of your own mind, and the nature of reality itself, uh, that transcend our ability to articulate literally in, in, in linear logical words? That, that is the question, I think. So by that definition, you know, you're walking down the street, and you see a tree, you see a sidewalk, you see a dog, you see a car. Those are all interpretations of phenomena that are actually, you know, in their essence, quite a different thing than what our senses bring to us. So you're, you're saying that, you know, by, by, the, by your definition, just the very act of living is um, dependent upon myths, or as you, if, you, if we're going to use that word, or in, interpretations of you know, based of what our senses bring to us. Absolutely. If there weren't, if, if there wasn't, uh, if there weren't a myth to bridge sense perception to inner meaning, and I, and I say meaning not only in the sense of purpose, but also in the sense of what is the denotation of what you see, the denotation and the connotations uh, of what you see. What does it mean? What does it imply? Uh, if you don't have this mythical bridge, there would be a complete disconnect from your inner life, your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, and your perceptions. There would be no bridge, no commerce between the two. They would be fundamentally dissociated. The bridge between the two is a narrative in terms of which you link the contents of perception to the emotions, thoughts, and insights that arise within you. The myths link the outer world to the inner world. And I use the outer world here, I don't mean it quite literally, but I, I will use it as a, as a, as a shorthand to, to, to refer to, 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 the, to the contents of perception. Uh, so yes, myths are integral to life. To, to pretend that one can live life without a myth is itself a myth that basically entails a very poor, a very restrictive interpretation of the world, a very existentialist interpretation of the world as something that has no meaning that itself is a myth, that itself 
is an interpretation. If there were truly no myths running in your mind, you would not open your mouth. You would say nothing. You would just witness. Hmm. Yeah. So um, I remember I was at somebody's house one time, and it was winter time, and it was drizzling and cloudy, and and uh, and she was saying, I, "I hate winter time. It's so depressing and all this." And and I was feeling good, and it looked kind of beautiful to me. So I mean, there's perhaps an example of. You know, a, a, a personal myth. I hate winter time. You know, it makes me depressed. Um, and whereas it's completely dependent upon your subjective orientation or interpretation of of the experience, and it could could be a very blissful time and a blissful experience. Absolutely. I mean, we are always running these little myths, right? And I think, uh, I mean, you, you were very connected to Advaita, Advaita Vedanta, and, and non-dualism. And one of the the, the underlying objectives of Vedanta, I think, is to eliminate these harmful little myths about, oh, I hate winter, and or, oh, I'm a bad person, or, oh, the future is bleak, um, you know, or, oh, uh, I should have done something different in the past. You know, uh, uh, these little myths uh, are very harmful in the sense that uh, they, they trigger harmful emotions and they make life unnecessarily uh, difficult. Um, so it, it is a legitimate goal to try to get rid of them. but. You, you can overshoot in Advaita, and you can go to the point where you think that the actual goal is to eliminate all myths. If you eliminate all myths, you are denying life. I mean, I even if the world we live in, uh, Rick, is, is an illusion in the sense that it isn't what it appears to be, in other words, that it, it, it isn't really out there as, as a physical reality independent of consciousness, it's just... Uh, uh, images arising in consciousness, which I think is the case, and I make this case in the book. Uh, even if that is so, then something true is generating that illusion in the same way that uh, a, a speaker generates sounds without itself being a sound. So there is something that is not an illusion and which is generating an illusion. And so the illusion will be an expression of that something. So I think it is, it, it is integral to life to interpret the illusion to grant it validity as such, the illusion as it may be, to grant it the, the, the validity it has for what it is, and to try to interpret it and derive meaning from it. Because the illusion may be the only way truth expresses itself. So I think it may, get, may go too far in Advaita to try to eliminate all interpretations. It may be a, a denial of nature, a denial of life uh, itself. Mm. A perfect example of what you just said is the famous snake and rope and string, rope and snake analogy in Vedanta, you know, where somebody's walking along in a dim light and there's a rope coiled up by the side of the road and they think it's a snake and they jump and they're all fe fearful and, you know, running away and so on. And then someone brings a light and, and points out to them, well, it's, it's really just a rope. So I don't think Vedanta is trying to eliminate the rope, it's just trying to eliminate the misinterpretation of the rope and, and the consequent fear you know, that results from that misinterpretation. I, I agree. I agree that this is, this is the legitimate uh, goal. I, I do think uh, there is a risk that, that, that people overshoot, that people go too far and they say, and, and I have seen it, uh, uh, People saying, well, what is the point of this? This is all an illusion anyway, so forget about it. You know, but it, it, Then you don't engage with life. And, and that's what I think is the denial of nature. And in that sense, I think there is value in religious myths. I'm not saying that all myths are religious myths. But religious myths are particularly rich because they try to see behind the symbols, uh, the phantasmagoria in the illusion. That phantasmagoria in the screen of perception uh, is composed of symbols. Those symbols mean something, not something that you can pin down in words and put your finger on and say, this is what it is, literally. But symbols that are pointing to aspects of our inner lives uh, that we may be dissociated from. And interpreting that phantasmagoria, I think, uh, is what religious myths may try to do. They, they, they lend significance uh, to, to, the, to the aspects of existence. I mean, we can talk about Christianity and the... The, the descent of the Holy Spirit that imbues every aspect of life, uh, life and, and every living creature uh, with a divine significance. I think there is something to that. It's a symbol pointing at something. It's pointing at the significance of the illusion uh, and the usefulness of, of, of engaging with life. Oh, yeah. And I just want to add, uh, before we elaborate on that, that, um, you know, Vedanta, like everything, can and has been uh, misinterpreted 
by you know ending up in the hands of people who don't fully and properly appreciate it. I mean, look at some of the various interpretations of Islam or of Christianity uh, that have come down through history or that are plaguing society even today uh, that are an embarrassment to the deeper, more mystical appreciation and, uh, of those traditions. Um, so, you know, there's this sort of so-called neo-advaita these days, which I, I don't think that, um, you know, Shankar would be rolling in his grave if he heard some of the things that are presented in the name of Vedanta. <laughs> 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 Although he was probably cremated, so I guess he can't roll. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, myths as part of any human activity can be abused. Yeah. Now uh, let's take an example of a myth, because in your book, for instance, you take the creation myth and you you go through several different cultures, Aboriginal and I think something from South America and the the Hindu um, treatment of that, and there's a striking similarity between these different myths. And um, let's take that as a case in point and discuss it a little bit. Sure. Do you want me to yeah, go, ahead go over some examples? Explain it a bit, yeah. yeah. Just to, to put the car ahead of the horses for, for a moment. And it's striking how they all are consistent with Vedanta. No? It's, uh, yeah, yeah. it's pretty striking. Um, we can start in, uh, in Australia. There is an Australian Aboriginal myth. Uh, the dream, one of the dream time myths. There, there are many. There's a, wild, a, a wide variety. I, I, I picked one because I thought it was a good example and representative of everything. Uh, the myth says that uh, the creator deity, Karora, uh, uh, dreamed the world up into existence and then woke up within his own dream. And uh, within the dream, he lost the magical powers of creation. He had to comply to the rules and constraints of the dream. So he got hungry. He had to, to eat some of the animals that he created. Uh, he met the people that he had created while dreaming. And every night he would go to dream again. He would sleep again, dream more stuff into existence. The next morning he would wake up again and within the dream. So you have this theme of a creator deity that creates the world as a thought, as, a, as an image in his imagination, in, as a dream in his mind, and then wakes up within his own dream. Um, and you see that on the other side of the world, uh, the Witoto tribe um, in the Amazon, uh, they have a, a mind-boggling myth. It was very difficult to summarize it accurately in a few words as I did in the book, because there are so many ways of interpreting it. It's so subtle, so nuanced. But the, the main line is that uh, the creator deity, this, called, this, this time called uh, Nainema, um, created the world as an illusion, a very elusive illusion in his mind that kept on escaping him. And to prevent the illusion from escaping, he tied it up with a magical rope and glued it. Uh, so he would basically fix that illusion as, as a sort of a, a more stable dream, if you want. And then he stamped on it until he broke through and entered his own dream. And from within the dream, he spit the jungle into existence. So again, you have this notion of the world created in the mind of a, of a deity, which then enters his own creation, enters his own dream. You have that in Hinduism where Brahman creates the primordial waters and then uh, drops his sperm in the primordial waters or his seed, as they call it, I think, in, in the Upanishads, uh, in, somewhere in the Vedas. And uh, from, from his seed in the primordial waters, uh, uh, a cosmic egg is created and Brahman itself hatches from that cosmic egg within his creation. So again, this, this self-recursive notion that uh, creator deity imagines the world into existence and then is born within it by hatching from the egg he put in there. And guess what? Christianity is the same thing. God created the word, the, the world through the word. That's the Gospel of John, right? In the beginning was the word, through the words all things were made. And the word is, of course, in the English translation for the Greek logos, which also means reason, thought. So God created the world through thought and then was born into it through the Christ. And the Christ was God fully and was man fully. So this theme uh, recurs, uh, which I, I thought was uh, pretty striking and rekindled my, my respect for religious mythology as symbolic narratives, not literal, not metaphoric either. A, a metaphor is just a, an indirect way of referring to something that can be made sense of literally. Yeah. It's just an easier to understand way uh, uh, for something that has a literal articulation. 
while a symbol has no literal articulation. It's pointing at something that cannot be said in words, can only be hinted at, indicated, pointed at, suggested. So it's rekindled my, my, my respect for religion in that sense. Yeah, and I would say that's true of everything. I mean, try describing the color of my shirt in, in words. You know, it's, well, it's blue, yeah, but what's blue? How do you describe that? Um, but I just wanted to add um, that it might be easy for people of a scientific bent to dismiss all these myths as primitive and, you know, kind of silly, uh, you know, notions of, of cultures that didn't really understand how the world works. But actually, if you, if you look deeply into science and, and kind of begin talking about the self-interacting dynamics of the unified field and sequential spontaneous symmetry breaking through which manifestation occurs and all, you actually find the same myth presented in scientific terms. Yeah, even if you didn't have those parallels, and I, I'll share my personal impression with you, even without those striking parallels uh, that you're referring to, uh, even if you read the myth alone by itself, so pretend you know nothing of science and physics and all this latest and greatest uh, developments, just looking at the myth itself, and then you you think about it, and you, you consider that, for instance, this, this Witoto uh, uh, myth uh, has emerged in a tribe that is... I mean, from our perspective, is extraordinarily primitive. They really have developed no technology, no written language, no, no culture in that sense whatsoever. Uh, it's a bow and arrow and a hunter and gatherer uh, culture. Uh, and the myth is of a sophistication. I mean, I didn't do justice to it in the way I just summarized it uh, now with you. But the myth is so nuanced, so sophisticated, and it's, it's mind-boggling to imagine that these guys could have composed this myth through steps of reasoning. Obviously, they didn't. They, they just don't have the intellectual background uh, to do that. So how, how did it happen? I think, and I discuss this in the book, I think what happens is that myths are not composed by thinking. They are not composed through thought steps in the ego, in the intellect. Uh, they are perceived like you perceive a landscape. They, they emerge from deep within the human psyche, from what uh, analytical psychology would call the unconscious. I don't like this word. I think it's a misnomer. I think there is no unconscious whatsoever. There are, there are only obfuscated segments of mind. It emerges from this obfuscated segment of mind, pure and complete, as a reality available to contemplation. And these guys then just wrap a word-based narrative uh, around it in order to create a reference to it within their culture, so they can talk about it. So myths are not composed intellectually, they're not created for a reason. They just pop, full and ready. And the differences between authentic myths are the differences with which different cultures use words to wrap that landscape they can perceive uh, uh, with a different narrative in order to refer to it uh, in the culture. And of course, in that process, myths can be abused, Bell, bells and whistles can be added in order to repress women and gay people and make the priests rich and powerful and whatnot. But this happens later, I think. True myths begin pure, as a pure contemplation of a transcendent truth available to aspects of the human mind that are very far away from the intellect. Mm. And this um, jibes perfectly with the whole Vedic tradition, and, and uh, which I know more about than other traditions, but I bet you they have their parallels in which, you know, most, if not all, significant truths come about through cognition, not, not through, you know, reasoning and logic. It's that the rishis or the seers uh, go deep within and, you know, and kind of use their, their mind and nervous system as a scientific research tool to plumb more fundamental aspects of reality and you know and cognize those deeper truths and then come out to express them in, in various ways and and I, I think that um, obviously people of every culture have been capable of that the, the human nervous system being what it is doesn't matter if they're a bow and arrow society there there would naturally be people in every society that um, have the spiritual insight or the mystical capability to cognize uh, the deepest truths of, of nature, and then, you know, naturally they're going to express them in their own language and within their own culture. I would even say they have uh, an advantage compared to us. Good point. I think that by the mere fact that we are humans, uh, we are connected, that we, that we have an umbilical cord 
to the, to the root of reality, right? To, to the source of it all, uh, because we are conscious beings. So by definition, we all have that, that umbilical connection somewhere deep in the mind. Um, and we can contemplate uh, those truths if you really introspect. Um, those pre-literary cultures uh, had less superficial myths running at the level of the intellect, less narratives telling them what is true, what's not, what's possible, what's not, what this means, what this doesn't mean. All this stuff, this baggage that is created in culture, these world views uh, that give or don't give us permission to contemplate this or that. Uh, they, they had less of that. They, 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 they had more of a, uh, a beginner's mind because they knew nothing. The, the entire world, the whole of reality was a big mystery to them. They didn't have prejudices or preconceptions. They were just there observing. And uh, they didn't have a narrative in their minds telling, oh, this should be possible, this shouldn't be possible, this is right or this is wrong. So there, there was less pollution between their eyes and the thing that they could contemplate, that, that inner truth that could be perceived uh, through the organ of the imagination, as uh, Rudolf Steiner would say. Um, also, so I think in that... Also, I mean, along the same lines, they weren't bombarded by television and all the, oh, yeah. all the distractions of modern culture. They're, they're out there sitting, looking at the stars, you know, and able to sort of... There you go. It's a contemplative atmosphere. There you go. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, it would be nice if you could... Uh, rescue some of that, uh, but it's nearly impossible in this day and age. Eh, I think the tides are turning, you know, people are sort of individually rescuing it for themselves anyway, and, and maybe if enough of them do that, then it'll, the culture will begin to display that change. And I think it's happening. Well, maybe it's happening. It's kind of polarizing, in my opinion. It, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true, and that's, that, and that's what worries me. But, but, but I see what you're, what, what you're alluding to. I agree. There is something happening on the positive side as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we could perhaps talk about that at some point. There might even be some myths about that, about polarization uh, being a harbinger of, of you know, societal change. You know of any? No. I but uh, I, I, hope, I hope it is the case, because then it offers some hope for what is happening now, this extreme polarization that we are, we are witnessing yeah. since the 20th century. Well, if we, if we took the Mahabharata as a myth, then that was an example of, of polarization, where the, the sort of the good and evil forces, oh, yeah. so, so to speak, had, had uh, sorted themselves out and were assembled in opposing armies. <laughs> and there was a huge... Yeah, but, but yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's from the beginning. I mean, you have uh, Zoroastrianism, which is also a very polarizing religion, you know, good and evil, and some, some currents of Islamic mysticism as well. But um, uh, that, 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 these are also creation myths, in a sense. Gnosticism is very polarizing as well. But this polarization happened in the beginning. I wonder if there is a myth saying that if it gets more extreme going forward, then it's a harbinger of change. That would be nice, but I don't know any myth that says that. So. Yeah. Well, I don't know when. Uh, in, in the Gita again, Lord Lord Krishna says when uh, when a, a dharma prevails, when when the when the t basically he's saying when the when the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of a dharma, or uh, kind of like violation of of natural law, then I take birth to restore it. Uh, so, uh, you know, sort of like God, what he's saying is God comes, an infusion of God consciousness comes into the world to restore the balance and, uh, as he puts it, to uplift the righteous and destroy the wicked. I know that sounds very apocalyptic and, 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 <laughs> and kind of judgmental, <laughs> but <laughs> that, I'm just kind of citing that as a, as a myth. Interesting. <laughs> God knows we need some of that influx uh, these days, uh, fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so as I go along here, just talk about anything that pops to mind, you know, because I'm sure there are plenty of things where I wouldn't have thought to ask a question. And if an idea comes to you as you're speaking, just launch into it and we'll, we'll go with sure. it. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, I have notes that I can rely upon. But uh, do you, is there anything at the moment that, you know, is percolating? No, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you for now. And uh, when something pops up, I will, I'll, I'll bring it in. Okay. Um, well, here's, here's something I highlighted. In a life informed by a religious myth, nothing is just so. Everything has a reason for being and a purpose to fulfill. Everything belongs in a bigger and timeless context. 
So I That's like, what myths I like do. that. Yeah. Uh, uh, religious myths are a particular way of translating the contents of perception, in other words, uh, the, the empirical world around us, into meaning within, significance within, mm -hmm. which leads to purpose. Um, the thing is, we are plagued as a culture uh, in the West, uh, and increasingly in the East, because we are sort of contaminating them with the myth of literalism, the myth that something can embody its own final meaning. The idea that uh, this is a, a glass of water and there is nothing else it is. This embodies its own meaning. It's a glass of water. That's it. It's the end of a cognitive chains of associations. You could start with a metaphor that points to another metaphor, that points to another metaphor, that points to a glass of water, but it ends there. There is a root to this chain of cognitive associations. And once you get there, that's it. That's the end of meaning. Then things just are. And this is a very Western uh, thing. And you know, science is philosophically based on this quest for this final root of meaning. What things actually are in and of themselves. And I think what religious myths help us do is to to embrace at an emotional level this idea that the things we see in the world are not their own meaning. That this glass of water itself is a symbol pointing at something else that is not part of the empirical world. Something that goes behind and beyond the empirical world. And that invests life with a, a spaceless slash timeless meaning because the, the, the contents of life, you know, the contents of perception, the things, events, people of the world, they are all indicating, pointing at something beyond. Um, and, and that is the richness that I think a religious myth can bring to life. I have a, an acquaintance who, and this is a true story, by the way, he may be listening to this, and, and I hope he doesn't mind that I'm telling him, I'm not going to mention his name. Um, he went on a quest uh, to Thailand to learn to meditate and, and do yoga and find himself and he has a, a difficult past that he wanted to transcend and find his true self and you know leave his past behind. Um, and at the, the final day of a long course he did and long uh, retreat, um, the final day, his house went up in flames. Burned up and he lost everything. Back All in, back pictures. in, at home, you mean? In, in Thailand. Oh, no, in Thailand. Thailand. Okay, that yeah, one. He, had, yeah. he moved his entire life to I Thailand. See. He rented a house by the beach. And, and everything that had, had, had importance to him wasn't in, in that house. You know, a uh, computer and hard drives with the pictures he took throughout his life. This seems quite symbolic, uh, <laughs> what you're yeah. getting at here. <laughs> yeah, all the notes and the books and, and the, the memorabilia that he accumulated throughout life, you know, the little memories and um, his clothes, his books, everything went up in flames. He was left with his wallet that was in his pocket and um, a motorcycle and uh, some clothes that he had um, in, in the laundry. Um, and look at the symbolic significance of this. I mean, and there are two ways we can approach this. One is to say the fire is its own meaning. In other words, it means nothing but a fire. That's all there is to it. It's just a fire. It happens. That's it. Or you see the fire as, as, as a, an embodiment of a, of, a, of a symbolism that has a lot to do with where he is in, in his mind and, and, and in this phase of his life. Mm. So that's the choice we have. If you're fired from work, it's either its own meaning, you were just fired, that's all. Or it's, uh, it's pointing at necessary change in your life. Uh, if you have a romantic relationship or a divorce, what does it mean? If you're ill, what does it mean? Uh, you know, your entire life can become an, an, an epic drama that extends <laughs> uh, uh, before your birth and beyond your death. And you are the main character uh, of yeah. that epic drama. I mean, uh, talk about uh, dramas on television. I mean, they're, they're nothing. I mean, there's this series now, uh, what's his name? Full of Dragons. And, uh, oh, uh, and, uh, yeah. The, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, your life is much more, it's much richer and more significant uh, than Game of Thrones if it is informed by a religious myth. And what I call a religious myth is any myth 
that points to transcendence. It doesn't really need to be religious in the in the sense that we normally understand the word religions. I, I define it in the book, so I should define it with you as well. Any myth that points to transcendence in a way that is legitimate and sound based on human deep and authentic human intuitions is a religious myth in that sense. Um, so if your, life, if your life is informed by those, suddenly it's not claustrophobic and, and meaningless anymore. Yeah. Suddenly it's a rich drama. I, yeah, I mean, if we could define a myth here, I would say that, you know, one nice myth to live by. Um, well, here's, here's one to juxtapose with it, first of all. Um, you say in your book, uh, where is it? Oh, I, I'm losing it. Something about real men and tough chicks. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, here it is, here it is. <laughs> Contemporary science cannot acknowledge even the possibility of meaning and purpose, for real men and tough chicks face bleak facts. This isn't skepticism, but cynicism, an, ar an arbitrary commitment to the impossibility of something. And um, for, for, you know, the way I perceive life and live it is that everything is pregnant with meaning and significance because every, everything is suffused or in, with intelligence and even science will tell us that if we look closely there's there's marvelous intelligence um, operating in everything on every level but I'll tell you a little story that happened to me yesterday um, we have this ice cream maker and um, you know my wife decided she's not going to bother making ice cream if we want ice cream we'll just buy some ice cream so it's this nice ice cream maker um, and so we went to have our hair cut yesterday and I called the, the lady who was going to cut her hair and said, hey, would you like an ice cream maker? And she said, yeah, I would. So we brought it over. And when we got there, she said, look at this. She picked up a magazine. She said, just this morning, I was looking at this magazine, and it was an article about ice cream makers. And here is the ice cream maker. It's a picture of it, the recommended one to get. This is the one you brought me. And I, I had thought just this morning, I would like an ice cream maker like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that co you know sheer coincidence, or is there some kind of deeper you know, thing going on there. It's, it's a synchronicity and it could reflect information transfers uh, in the world beyond what we today acknowledge as possible from what we understand uh, in science. It, it could reflect the fact that human psyches are not really insulated from each other, that they are all connected to each other at root because they may be dissociated fragments of only one consciousness, right? The universal consciousness or, or Brahman or the Godhead, uh, many myths call it different names. Um, so, so I acknowledge synchronicities, but I think the significance of the world uh, at a symbolic level goes beyond synchronicity. It's not only these meaningful coincidences, even if there isn't any coincidence whatsoever, the thing in front of you right now, the fact that we are talking to each other right now and, and, and how the weather is today and what's going to happen to you tomorrow, uh, those have their own symbolic significance. I think, uh, you know, it, this may sound anti-Advaita, but it isn't really. Actually, it's completely Advaitic. Um, and, and, and if I may just uh, take a, a tangent uh, here, sure. uh, uh, Rick, because I think it's worthwhile. You see, if one can look upon the world without judgment, the world becomes a cosmic drama. The world loses its symbolic significance only when we start passing judgment on it, when we start telling ourselves, this shouldn't have been so, or this has to be so, or that person is silly, or is an ass, or, you know, when you start passing judgment, we flatten the drama and it becomes provincial, pedestrian, trivial, almost. Um, we don't do that when we are watching a movie. If you're watching War and Peace uh, on TV or if you're reading War and Peace, I mean, there are so many assholes in that, uh, in that story, right? There are so many people that uh, if you would judge them, if, the, if, if they were your friends or acquaintances, you would judge them so badly and you, make them, you would make them so small. But in War and Peace, they are heroes. They are main characters in that drama. And, and why do you see them that way? Because you're not, not judging them. Uh, you're, you're reading or watching it for what it is, which is a symbolic drama that points to the realities of the human psyche and, and the human society. 
Um, so if we could adopt that same attitude of reading a novel, reading a rich symbolic novel as you live your life, uh, without that judgment, you would restore the symbolism of the world that myths attempt to point to. And what does Advaita do? It helps you achieve exactly that, to experience the world without this judgment. So Advaita is extremely con conducive to this, although it's often interpreted to mean the opposite, which is if you don't judge the world, then you don't see any meaning in it, and then you become aloof because it's all an illusion anyway, and yeah, forget about it. You know, just roll up in a corner and wait to die because it's all for nothing anyway. Well, that's the option one has. How are you going to look at it? Yeah, that again, though, is not true of Vedanta, I don't think. That's not the way the founders and great teachers of Vedanta live their lives. Um, it seems to me that it, you know, on this point of judging, if we are saying that things shouldn't be the way they are or there's something wrong with the weather or there's something wrong with you know, the way the universe is, is working, then implicitly we're um, denying the existence of, of God. We're denying the existence of a deeper intelligence that's actually um, running the show, you know, Absolutely. Or orchestrating things. We're, we're kind of co-opting that authority and saying, I know better how things should be and, you know, I'm in charge yeah. of this universe, which is absurd. Yeah. There is a, uh, this, this brings back to me a, a book by Thomas Moore, an old book from the early 90s by Father Thomas Moore, who was a psychotherapist mm -hmm. for, for many years, and he wrote a book called uh, uh, About the Soul, Cultivating the Soul, Soul Making, and I don't remember the, 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 the title of the book anymore. But he mentions one beautiful example. He talks about family. I mean, we all have most of us have a very difficult relationship with our families, right? It's pure love and hate. We love them, but if they stay around too long, oh, we hate them, you know, and it brings the worst in us uh, because of this judgment. You know, my mother should be different, my father should be different, or they should have been different, which is even worse. Or mm. uh, this is how they should, they should behave, or how they should not behave, and so on and so forth. And we are judging our families, and, and we make them very small, and we want distance from them because it's all trouble. And what uh, Moore says uh, in the book is, uh, if you inject soul in that, you refrain from judging, and you will read the story of your family as you read War and Peace. You <laughs> know what I mean? As you read one of the great epics. And each member of your family will acquire a sort of an archetypal quality. And archetypes, they're not all good. Many archetypes are pretty, quote, bad right? They're pretty disgusting sometimes, or you don't want to have them around. But if you watch your, the members of your family as embodiments of that archetypal dynamics, suddenly it's invested with soul, which was Moore's word for what I mean by invested with meaning and, and significance, symbolic meaning. What are archetypes but symbolic manifestations of deep patterns, psychic patterns uh, in mind, in consciousness itself? Nice. Here's a question that just came in. Let's read this. Um, this is from Dan in London. He asks, Through lucid dreams, I'm always exploring the dream reality and comparing it to actual reality as a way to explore the nature of reality. I have noticed that the dream reality, if explored carefully, that is, you look at a blade of grass carefully and you'll notice all the details you'd expect in the waking reality and can't tell a difference, it's interesting that all the myths you mentioned in terms of the creation of the world relate to a deity dreaming the world into existence. Do you think lucid dreaming can play a part in the exploration of reality to come to such conclusions about reality as those myths you have mentioned? Absolutely. I think it is a formidable tool. It is a very difficult tool to master. I have never mastered it. I have had lucid dreams. Um, I adopted a very scientific approach in the lucid dream. I did precisely what he's describing, uh, trying to find any, any quality or characteristic in the world of dreams that would allow me to differentiate it from waking life purely perceptually. I could differentiate it because I could remember the history. I knew I was asleep because I remember I went to bed and so on. Uh, but they differentiate it based on perceptual qualities, and I couldn't. So I think what lucid dreams tell us is that uh, mind is perfectly capable of creating this. This whole shebang, all the dramas of life, all the contents of perceptions, galaxies, black holes, galaxy clusters, all the way to grains of sand, ants, and, and electrons. 
mind is perfectly capable of creating this. And you know that for yourself uh, if you're a capable, regular, uh, lucid dreamer, which I am not. So I think uh, it, 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 there is a hint based on direct experience right there about what these myths were trying to say. Who is creating the world right now but you? Not the you, Rick Archer or Bernardo Castro, but the true sense of I that, that is witnessing uh, Rick Archer and Bernardo Castro and, and whoever else uh, is out there, um, that is imagining uh, the world into existence. And I think myths are pointing to that. In, in part three of the book, I try to elaborate it, uh, on it in slightly more analytical, explicit uh, terms. And I do that, guess what, in the form of a myth, a dialogue between an archetypal figure and an explorer of consciousness that could have been a lucid dreamer. Um, in, in, in the book, I, I, I talk about it in different terms. There is a lot of technology involved there to, to put this explorer in a sort of a, an altered state of consciousness where he can interact with this archetypal figure and learn about the nature of reality and how everything came into existence. But it could have been a lucid dream. If lucid dreamers can establish a, a dialogue with an archetypal figure manifested in symbolic form within a lucid dream, which is extraordinarily difficult to do, especially if you're trying. Usually it happens when you're not trying. Uh, but if that happens, you probably can have a dialogue of the kind that I mythically described uh, in part three of the book. Hmm. Nice. Here's another question. Um, Elizabeth from the United States asks, myth and science are often presented as being polar, op polar opposites myth having to do with fantasy and imagination and science having to do with truth. Do you agree with this? How are myth and science different and how are they similar? Thanks. It's a, it's a, terminolo it's a terminology question. Uh, I define myths not as true or untrue, but I define it based on the original etiology of the Greek word, mythos, which became mythos and which became myth, which means a narrative, a report, a story, in terms of which we can interpret the contents of the world. That's how I define the word. So myths can be true or untrue without ceasing to be myths in the way I use the word. In modern culture, especially in a scientific context, people use the word myth in the sense of fantasy, which is different. A fantasy is also a myth. It's a myth ungrounded on empirical facts. Um, but in the book, when, every time I use the word myth during this interview and in the book, I mean something broader. I mean, I mean a story in terms of which we can interpret the contents of perception. In other words, the world out there. Now, science itself today, in the way it is practiced, is based on myths. Every time, in, in the way I define the word, every time you have a narrative for interpreting experiments, you're running a myth in, in the way I define uh, the word. And that myth can be true or untrue. You can have a hypothesis tested and proven to be untrue or tested and proven to be true, and you still have a myth. Uh, philosophically, we would say that any interpretation of scientific observations in, in, in th that give you an idea about what things actually are, we call it an ontology. An ontology is a myth of reality, a myth of what reality essentially is. Um, science itself, not in the way it's practiced, but in the way it should be, in the way it was originally uh, uh, defined, is ontology independent. Science itself does not actually require myths or interpretations. It only requires correct predictive models that can be tested under controlled conditions. In other words, you do not need to know what an atom is, what an electron is, what an orbital or a photon are. You do not need to know what they essentially are. All you need to know is that if a photon hits an electron in a certain orbital, it will jump to the next orbital. This is a model, a predictive model. It tells you that if this happens, then that will happen as a consequence. These models can be verified and proven to be correct or incorrect, and that is the business of science. But if you're a scientist, you might also want to know what they are. Um, that might be another That's the thing. inquiry. That's the thing. In practice, all scientists will be running an, ontol an ontology myth in their minds. They will be telling themselves what this probably means. But that's no longer science. Officially, this is philosophy. The problem is that what happens today is that scientists like uh, 
uh, Krauss and, and Hawking, um, they, they, they put down philosophy as something completely unnecessary, and then they go ahead and do philosophy. <laughs> and because they're completely ignorant of philosophy, they do philosophy in a miserably wrong, pathetic way. <laughs> and, and these are the people telling our kids what reality is, especially in the United States. Mm. Um, and I think that's a problem. So you're saying, just for clarification here, that um, if science begins to get into wanting to know ultimately what things are, then it, it has strayed into the realm of philosophy, and that, that's not really the business of science, that's the business of philosophy. Is that what you just said in the last that's couple minutes? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, it's not the business of science to investigate the essential underlying nature of things. Why shouldn't it be? Why, why is that not a legitimate purpose of science? I mean, because isn't that what, what quantum physicists and you know, the, the, the more advanced uh, realms of science are trying to do? I think the methods of science are not suitable for this. Wow. The methods of science, I mean, there are three ways you can explore the, wor the, the world. One is through uh, uh, theoretical thinking, logical thinking, logic. The other one is through empirical observation. And the third one is through introspection. Science uses only the first two, and it completely ignores the third. The problem is, to understand the underlying nature of things, you cannot ignore the third. You can ignore the third one, introspection, if all you want to do is to, 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 to come up with correct predictive models. If this happens, then that will happen as a con consequence. If that other thing happens, then this happens as a consequence. This is what science can do through its methods. Uh, the third one is totally beyond the scope of, of a methodology that ignores introspection. And that's where things go dramatically wrong, because most scientists ignore what I just said. They do not recognize what I just said. Yeah, this is one of my favorite themes, actually, if, if I understand you correctly. Um, you worked at CERN for a while, you know, which is where the Large Hadron Collider is these days. And, um, you know, that's a very sophisticated instrument. And, and using that, they're, they're trying to observe the way very fun fundamental particles behave with one another and so on. And uh, I, I always like to think of the, um, the human nervous system as the ultimate particle accelerator, so, so to speak. Not that we accelerate particles with it, but that it's the, the ultimate tool for, it, it's, the, it's the scientific instrument that we use if we want to do introspection. And that, um, that its very structure is vastly more sophisticated um, than the LHC, than the Large Hadron Collider. And therefore, it is capable of doing things that that instrument, is, well, firstly, isn't designed to do, but could never, that no instrument that man makes could ever do. Uh, because no, we couldn't make an instrument as sophisticated as the human nervous system. And why should we bother? Because we already have one. All we, have, all we have to do is learn how to use it properly. And, you know, using it properly, we can plumb the very uh, fundamental you know, ground of, of existence and, and introspectively cognize uh, the deepest realities of nature's functioning and existence. I wouldn't disregard either approach. I think they are complementary. Well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying ways. we should, it's either or. I'm, I'm saying they both have yeah. different functions. And they come together, which is counterintuitive for most people in Western society today. I think introspection brings you uh, if this is what you want to understand, introspection brings you from one side and, uh, and empirical analysis brings you at the same point from the other side. Mm -hmm. And where they meet is where the, the meat is, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, I, if you pardon the, the pun. Sure. Uh, what is the empirical world but the patterns of excitation of mind itself? When, when mind is excited, that excitation appears to you in the screen of perception mm -hmm. as the atoms, the electrons, the fundamental subatomic particles. And you don't just mean explosive. individual mind here, you mean mind with a capital, I mean a, mind capital at M. Large. Yeah. I, mean, I mean universal consciousness, right. mind at large, right. Brahma, and Godhead, yes. uh, uh, Karora, Nightmare, whatever. whatever so name. your analogy of whirlpools in water, what is, what is a whirlpool? It's just water, but it's a sort of a, you know, a, a current in the water that seems to have a structure which it ultimately it doesn't, it's nothing but water, right? That's right. So yeah. our personal psyches would be like whirlpools in a stream. And right. what I'm referring to as mind at large is the stream itself, not right. the individual uh, whirlpools. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So if the empirical world are the ripples on the stream that whirlpools can see when they look around to their, to their neighborhoods, um, there are two ways of studying these excitations of minds. One is through introspecting, and the other one is through aggressive empirical investigation, like what happens at Large Hadron Collider, mm -hmm. a project that I worked on from its inception in oh, did you? 1994. Yeah, cool. it was, uh, I, I was part of the data acquisition team for the Atlas detector of the LHC, ah. which is one of the two main detectors, the Atlas and, and the CMS. I worked in the Atlas detector. I was watching a documentary so, on that just a few weeks ago, and, and they were showing that, that very thing. I had no idea that you, you were part of that. I, I was part of the data acquisition system, which mm -hmm. doesn't sit inside the onion itself, the detector itself. It's a, it's, it's a large computer system next to it. Mm -hmm. in, 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 it's connected by cables. It, it, it's, not right, it's not down there in the tunnel, uh, but it's essential for the detector. Uh, well, never mind. I don't want to get into, into the technical details of that. Right. But I think introspection and empiricism are complementary. So I think um, science is very informative to philosophy, especially philosophy of mind or neurophilosophy. Um, uh, we would be operating more or less blind in neurophilosophy today. Well, not completely blind because we would still have introspection, but it's extraordinarily helpful to have neuroscience give us empirical facts about what happens. We don't need to, in scientists don't need to interpret those facts, but they can gather these facts in a way that is internally consistent uh, and, and robust and repeatable. Uh, and, and, and isolates variables, so it makes interpretation uh, easier. I think that's extraordinarily important and useful. At the same time, I think it applies, the, the same rationale applies the other way around as well. Science without philosophy is purely an enabler for engineering. It helps us build computers and microphones and airplanes uh, and, and telephones, and it helps us have this conversation. But without philosophy, it informs us not at all about the underlying nature of reality. It only plays that role if it's coupled to philosophy. And philosophy can be much expedited uh, through the empirical uh, uh, information that arises from, from science. So I think the marriage is important. And the marriage shouldn't be such that one party completely dominates the other or puts the other down, like a, a dominating husband put, putting down his wife. We, we, we don't, it, it, it wouldn't work. This has to be a marriage of equals that meet somewhere in the middle. And I think that's where things have been going wrong. I mean, um, in the early days, philosophy was not informed by science and it pursued all kinds of, of uh, useless avenues of thought and speculation, totally ungrounded on, on reality because it was not empirically informed in a systematic way. Today, we, we, the pendulum swung to the other side. Now we have science saying, we don't need philosophy, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I think philosophy itself lost its moorings uh, because, you know, it perhaps lost its ability to um, have mystical insight or have deep, profound cognition. And so, you know, people who called themselves philosophers were like people sitting on a frozen lake, uh, you know, kind of looking through the ice and kind of speculating about what might be un down there. You know, maybe there's sea monsters or maybe there's mermaids or whatever. They're coming up, up with all kinds of ideas that actually bore no resemblance to, to truth or became very distorted and strange because, again, that there had, if there had ever been a, a fairly common um, access to deeper mystical truth through, through introspection, through subjective experience, it had somehow been lost. And, uh, and so, you know, when science dawned in, uh, around the period of the Renaissance, it did so as in response to a very rather s strange ideas that had come to dominate, right, mainly in the hands of the church. Um, and so it was really a much needed antidote to, to, the, to the weirdness that had come to, you know, the that had become dogma in the popular, you know, I agree, culture. but you see, the, the, the problem that science became an antidote for only arose when we started interpreting myths literally. Mm, yeah. Then things started going south. Right, right. Uh, because then we started speculating wildly about, uh, not only widely, but wildly about uh, what the facts of the matter were. And, um, and, and completely ungrounded on reality. And we started taking those stories Literally, so instead of listening, instead of contemplating 
deep landscapes of transcendent truth, deep within the mind, we started making up stories in the intellect and then interpreting them, them literally. These myths were not religious myths in the sense that they didn't emerge from deep within that umbilical cord that connects us to the source of truth. They were made up through observation of the world and, and intellectual exercises, but ungrounded on systematic observation of the world. The world. And, and then they became silly myths that were interpreted literally, and then it was a disaster. And science came as an antidote of that. Yeah. But it corrected more than the original problem, because now <laughs> it went down the path of saying, even religious myths are nonsense. And by the way, we don't need any interpretative framework, philosophical interpretative framework for science, because science itself already provides the answers. That's absolutely silly. That's just applying a certain ontology, a certain philosophical view to the data without even knowing that you're doing it. So yeah. blind when it comes to it. And also religion had co-opted a lot of stuff that um, it had no business messing with, such as astronomy. You know, okay, well now the, the Earth is the center of the, of the universe and, and that has religious significance. It means that man is, is ultimately important and, you know, and the, the, the planets have to move in circles, not ellipses, because circles are perfect and ellipses aren't. So religious, religions were getting into all kinds of stuff that I don't think that the founders of religion, such as Jesus or Buddha, would have wanted them to. Uh, so science kind of saved the day in that, in that respect. Um, well, the, 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 the perfect circus thing was actually a philosophical speculation. Oh, was it um, Plato or somebody? It, yeah, it, it comes from very old times in Greece prior to Jesus, I think. Uh, this idea of the, you know, the, the perfect spheres and, and so on. But uh, I think religious institutions are guilty of what you're saying. Uh, once you have an institution with people, you have all the negative aspects of people playing a role there. Greed, status and power seeking, uh, even sexual, uh, whatever, motivations. Um, so the religious institution can hijack a myth with uh, terrifying consequences, like burning witches and, and uh, converting new also. world, the Inquisition, converting the new world people oh, yeah. to, to Christianity and completely removing meaning from their lives or the Crusades uh, mm -hmm. going to a place where they had no business and then killing everybody there. Um, and of course, the Muslims are no less guilty of this uh, as well, radical uh, fundamentalist Islam. Mm -hmm. It's very visible today for doing something similar, probably, well, at a much lower scale than what Christians have done, but uh, much more visible uh, today. Uh, I, I'm not pro or against any particular religion, um, by the way, and I didn't mean to, to sound biased here. But uh, I think we should discern, make a difference between a religious institution with its own problems and biases and prejudices, and also with its benefits, uh, because you know, without some form, in, some form of institutional support, it's hard to see how a religious myth can be maintained vital and alive without institutional support. So there are pros and cons to religious institutions, but we have to differentiate all that from the original religious myth itself. Yeah. The original short little story, rich in symbolism, that emerges spontaneously and ready uh, from the obfuscated mind, and which people very long ago contemplated and tried to wrap around in words. Yeah. Also, just to put a cap on that, I mean, religious institutions were not only um, inimical to other cultures and all, but even to the mystics within their own tradition. I mean, people like, you know, St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, they got a really hard time from the religious administrators <laughs> of their day because they were actually having genuine, direct mystical insights and that kind of threatened those who clung uh, desperately to mere beliefs. Yeah, if you have a direct connection to transcendence, uh, you don't need an intermediary. Yeah. And if you don't need the intermediary, what power does the intermediary have? So, of course, these people and others, Swedenborg comes to mind, of course they were a threat. Mm -hmm. yeah. They could access these things directly. Remember, there was a time, only a few hundred years ago, when Christians were not supposed to even read the Bible. Yeah. We shouldn't forget that. So uh, the, this, this thing, this idea of well, you need an intermediary and we will take care of you, don't try to have this experience yourself, this has a very long history. Yeah. Um.
Fortunately, not so much of a history in, in, the, in the Hindu or Vedic tradition. I mean, there, you know, the, the teachers, I mean, I'm sure there are examples of it, but there the teachers would want their students to have the same experience they had and to graduate, so to speak, and become uh, experiential authorities in, of themselves without needing it, without needing, the teachers tried to put themselves out of a job, essentially, if they were good ones. <laughs> and still, you have the whole, the whole, you know, thing around gurus and the way they dress and you know yeah. the the flower necklaces and the throne high in the room in front of the room and all the adoration and all that stuff. So it happens in the east too. It it may be less officially institutionalized as yeah, it has been right. in the west, but uh, it, it's happening. Now let, let's kind of wrap up a, a theme we've been discussing. I think which which we haven't we haven't quite done the conclusion on it, and that is that. Um, you know, science arose as a, uh, to fulfill a need that was, you know, pretty dire uh, because society uh, or, or human thinking was so, uh, so gripped by ridiculous myths. And so science said, hey, wait a minute, let's, let's understand things correctly here and, and see what's really going on. But as you said, um, science threw the baby out with the bathwater and, uh, and even today, generally, totally rejects myth as, as meaningless and, and silly. Uh, but we've seen what can happen to the world with, without that sort of deeper spiritual orientation where uh, materialistic understanding of things is allowed to dominate and, and the implications that, had for, that, that it's having for the environment and you know, species extinction and you know, all this stuff. Um, so if all goes well, you know, how would you see, um, you know, a decade or two or three or four down the line, uh, how, how would you envision a world in which a proper balance had been restored between the empirical and, and the um, intuitive? I think that was the word you used, the intuitive? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what would an ideal world look like if, if those two were actually in proper balance and relationship with one another? Before I answer this directly, let me just make a comment. Uh, we never abandoned myths. They are just hidden. Uh, and they don't have this label anymore. If you look at science today, uh, all the multiverse cosmologies with copy of copies, countless copies of Rick Archer <laughs> living their lives in countless parallel universes and gazillions more emerging every tiny, every tiny fraction of a second. I mean, what is that but a, a rich myth in which you never die because there is always a you somewhere else that didn't die mm. or even if you die you will be reborn exactly as you are today at some point in the cosmological future because there is enough time for that to happen and there are uh, there are limited states in the universe so combination of states will inevitably repeat at some point yeah so this, this or, is almost or ray kurzweil wanting to upload ray his kurzweil. mind to a computer so he can be eternal or that kind of nonsense that was going to be my next example you yeah. see if consciousness, consciousness is generated from material arrangements hey then it can be downloaded or uploaded uh and then that's another door to immortality the difference here is that uh, in the modern scientific myth making covertly also aiming at transcendence and immortality the difference is that what is invested with power is the ego the ego now has the power to control transcendence through technology not deities not the archetypal forces of the obfuscated mind um, there is a recent uh, 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 psychological study uh, done here at uh, the University of Cologne, if I'm not mistaken. At least the lead uh, researcher uh, it was published this year. Um, they, they did research with volunteers and they could show that uh, belief that science will eventually attain uh, control of nature uh, is perceived as uh, very empowering comforting as a means to reduce anxiety, depression, and all that. That belief in the power of science to completely control nature, and the belief that... Uh, in every realm, I suppose, agriculture, disease, environment, everything. everything. Okay. Yeah, so uh, a sort of transhumanist uh, idea, but without the downloading of consciousness of Ray Kurzweil, just extraordinarily advanced uh, medicine that would get you to live a uh, hundred years, a thousand years, or, or even beyond. This belief was 
perceived and, and the belief that this is within reach, that it may happen within our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our kids, uh, is very empowering. It has a religious tone to it. But again, it invests the ego, not the deities, with the power to control transcendence. So we never lost the myths of transcendence. They are covert. The only difference is that they are now focusing on the ego as opposed to focusing on what the ancient, ancients would call the soul, which is your how you truly feel, what you truly want, not what you think you feel, not what you think you want, but how you feel inside, in the chest, in the gut, not in the head. And that's the difference. Now, how can we restore balance? Um, I, I'm, I'm very bad at coming up with recipes for things, uh, Rick, as uh, you know me well enough uh, to know this by now. Uh, I, I focus on analyzing and understanding what is. Uh, yeah, but if, let's theory. say to... Uh... You know, if you were able to, if you were a science fiction writer or a futurist and you wanted to um, portray a civilization in which uh, a proper balance had been restored between science and, you know, mystical insight or, or uh, intuitive insight and that each was flourishing to in, in its full value, uh, but in a way that was in, in which they were harmonious with each other and complementary to one another. Uh, you know, what would that look like to you? I, I, hope, I hope you're honest, even though we, we, it will not be nice, what I'm, I'm going to say. Okay. Um, I think that the train of a physicalist science has enormous momentum now. It's a very heavy, very large train, and it's going at a very, very high speed. It is nearly impossible to stop it. Um, within any term that we can contemplate uh, now. Um, I see only one hole that can be explored, and it's precisely the hole I'm focusing on, and that is the hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That is the fact that we cannot explain the qualities of experience, the warmth of love, the readiness of an apple, uh, the bitterness of disappointment. We cannot explain these qualities on the basis of parameters of physical systems, like uh, spin, momentum, form, angle, uh, mass, uh, uh, charge. These, these are completely disconnected, disjoint worlds. You cannot explain one in terms of the other. And, and that's, that's even in principle so. So it's a very fundamental gap, and there are more and more people looking at it, scratching their heads and thinking, what are we doing wrong? What are we seeing wrong? I mean, the answer is obvious. Right? Here we have consciousness imagining things like electrons and atoms outside consciousness and then becoming puzzled why it can't explain itself on the basis of its own abstractions. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious what's going on. Consciousness is abstracting things into existence, contents of consciousness itself, and then it can't figure out how it can explain itself on the basis of its abstractions. It will never do that. It's changing, chasing its own tails, its own tail. It's like a dog running around in circles. Um, and that's the hard problem. And because there are more and more people seeing this for what it is, that we are dogs chasing our own tails here, we never come out of it. I think that offers some hope. But my feeling is that it's not going to happen in time. I think what will happen to restore balance is catastrophe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, with your train metaphor, there have been several train crashes in recent years where high-speed trains went into curves much too quickly because the conductor wasn't paying attention or something and they went off the rails. And I think this this so-called unstoppable train of, of science is heading for the curve. <laughs> physicalist science. And that, when I yeah. say physicalist science, I mean science prejudiced by a particular ontology. Right. Science itself, without a, a, an ontological load, an ontological bias or prejudice, uh, causes no harm. It only gives us tools. It's what we do with the tools based on how we interpret what we see in science. That's where things go incredibly wrong. For instance, if uh, take the position of eliminative materialism, and this is uh, the idea that uh, consciousness doesn't really exist. That's what Michael Graziano has been saying, Daniel Dennett and the church lines and a few other uh, people with uh, questionable sanity, if you ask me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so here we have consciousness denying that consciousness exists. 
or consciousness saying that consciousness is an illusion. But wait a moment, where do illusions happen but in consciousness? So, well, there is a short circuit here. But um, if these guys, and, and these guys are published by, you know, major journals and, and, and even the New York Times and the New Yorker magazine and the Atlantic and, and, and other mainstream magazines, they get a lot of airtime, they are taken seriously. Which is incredible, but it, it, it is so. They are taken seriously. Now, what is the implication of this interpretation of reality? If you say that consciousness doesn't exist, that all that really exists is matter outside consciousness, what possible meaning can there be to life but the accumulation of consciousness? This is the necessary answer because there is no other answer. There is no other possible conceivable meaning. And, and then what do you do? You, you plunder, you, 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 you don't care about the future of the planet because once you're dead, you're dead. Anyway, you're not going to live to see the catastrophe. Uh, all you can do is collect your material stuff and enjoy it as much as you can and to hell with the rest. So you see, what, what causes the trouble is the interpretation. When we lay a myth, a story on top of those predictive models of science that inform us what will happen if this happens and so on and so forth, uh, we, we, we load a tool with an interpretation that leads to disaster. Uh, science itself will only offer the tools. I think the problem, the problem is in the interpretation. So I wouldn't blame science. I would blame physicalist, contaminated science. Yeah. I, I mean, you use the term obfuscated mind, and to obfuscate means to make something unclear or occluded to some extent. And it um, seems to me that people who come up with these, um, these, these very sort of anemic myths about the world are just not seeing very clearly. They're, they're occluded, they're obfuscated. Um, I mean, it amazes me actually that a scientist uh, or a doctor or anyone with, with, who looks at nature very, very closely could be an atheist because they more than anyone are, you know, ha have the, the, the sort of the, the beauty and intricacy of nature, the, the obvious intelligence of nature staring them in the face. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a cell biologist and you're looking at the mechanics of a cell, how could you possibly conclude that that's just some mechanistic little, little thing that is not being orchestrated by uh, unfathomably rich intelligence? It, it, I think uh, I have a theory about this. Uh, huh? I think there is a surprising psychological gain for these people to say what they say and to think what they think. It's very covert. They portray themselves as just staring the hard facts in the face and biting the bullet. And in that sense, they make themselves better than you and me because we are just wishful thinkers, right? We are just dreamers. We want reality to be different than what it is. And they just stare the hard facts in the face. But actually, there is tremendous psychological gain by taking this position. Uh, but it, 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 it's a complex theory I have. I'm, I'm, I'm submitting a paper, actually, to a psychology journal with it. Huh. I'm not sure you want to get into this. but. Um, uh, there is psychological gain. This is this is biased. Well, in they, a nutshell, are that, you implying that the psychological gain is a buttressing of their individual ego? It's it's sort of like a an attempt to um, you know, that's, to strengthen and maintain. Uh, you know, that that's certainly part of it. Yeah, yeah, I think there's more to it. It goes deeper. It has to do with gaining meaning. Surprisingly enough, because hmm. you see, uh, one major source of meaning, the main source of meaning humanity has had historically is religious myths, the transcendence, the teleological transcendence that, and, and the immortality that religious myths uh, uh, offer. Once we lost the ability uh, around mid of the 19th century, we lost the ability to relate to religious myths without intellectual scrutiny. So you were forced to disregard them. If people felt that they were intellectually honest, they had to disregard those myths. And that created an ontological trauma. People were traumatized because now they had to stare their own mortality in the face. And that's a tremendous loss of meaning. We know that from terror management theory today, that mortality salience, as it's called in psychology, you know, the fact that you have to acknowledge your own approaching mortality, that is a tremendous threat to your sense of meaning in life. And, uh, but the thing is, meaning has multiple sources. And uh, there is a theory called um, uh, meaning uh, meaning management uh, model or something like this. Uh, there's an, a, the core idea is fluid compensation. And the idea is if, if you lose one source of meaning, 
you will compensate by getting meaning from another source. And another source of meaning is closure. It's a major source of meaning. So if you lose meaning from religious transcendence, you will emphasize closure to restore meaning. It's like a... a closure means what? Closure means that you have an understanding of why things happen. They may be shit, but at least you understand why they're shit. For instance, if... Uh, so you, have, you feel like you have it all figured out, and that, that, you that, that, that gives you out. some security. It gives you meaning, a right. sense of meaning. Uh, not security, a sense of meaning. Uh, for instance, if you are... Suppose you're trying very hard to get a promotion, and you fail. That destroys your sense of meaning. Uh, or, or, or significantly impacts it, and you compensate that by telling yourself, but that company is a piece of crap anyway, mm -hmm. and that gives you closure. Mm -hmm. So we play this little game inside our heads all the time. This is established psychological fact. We know that from the MMM, fluid compensation, and all that. It happens subliminally. Um, I think what materialists do is they compensate uh, the meaning that has been robbed from them by their intellect which is the bouncer of the heart and doesn't allow them to relate spontaneously to religious myths anymore, they compensate by seeking closure. And what is science doing? Science is by far the biggest attempt humanity has ever made to come up with a complete, causally closed model of reality. So yes, reality may be shit, we may be dying, it may all be lost anyway, but at least we figured it out, and that gives us a sense, at least we won that. We won a battle here, we get something out of it. And I think that's what is underlying this, but okay, it's a... It's a it's that's an interesting <laughs> line of thinking. And it's interesting to note the arrogance or audacity of the, or of the attitude of many of these people. There's a sort of a, a certainty, a finality, you know, of this is the way it is and everybody else is stupid. Um, and whereas it's and kind of juxtapose that with a lot of spiritual teachers these days who talk a lot about um, the value of not knowing and the value of uncertainty and you know keeping an open mind and never considering yourself to have kind of final answers to anything but life is a continuous exploration and a mystery that to me is a much more humble and um, healthy yeah, but it's, you see, most people, in, uh, I hope my science colleagues, and I still have many, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't take me wrong uh, when I say this. Oh, they but, probably uh, won't be watching this anyway. Well, I, I, I can refer to someone. I can cite someone else and, uh, and get rid of my own guilt and my own responsibility here. Let me cite uh, Thomas Kuhn, who wrote... Uh, the structure of Scientific the structure of Revolutions. Revolutions, yes. Um, a lot of what goes on in science is game playing. Mm -hmm. People are playing games. Uh, they made the, they, they made the rules themselves, uh, and and they play those games, and they can win or they can lose. And when they win, it's a big kick. It's like winning a chess tournament, you know, or winning an, an Olympic competition. Uh, you feel good about yourself, and that gives you meaning too, because uh, um, uh, uh, self. Um, what's the right word for that? If you have a positive view of yourself, that gives you meaning as well. So it's one of the sources of meaning, uh, amenable to fluid compensation. So uh, I think what you see is uh, a lot of grown-up adolescents who are very smart, who enjoy their games very much, uh, can avoid the toughest existential questions of their lives by focusing all their energies and passions in playing those games, the games bring them a strong sense of meaning despite the pessimistic outlook of materialism for the reasons we just discussed, which are usually covert. No, nobody talks about that, but it gives them a sense of meaning. And they go on playing this game uh, all their lives. And self-esteem is boosted because, hey, they understand the world and most people on the streets don't understand. And if they speak out and pretend that they understand, we have to shut them up because they're ignorant idiots anyway, and we are the ones who understand. It's the new priesthood. Mm. They are now placing themselves, like priests in the past, in the recent past, uh, as intermediaries between people and truth. They're basically telling you, you can't figure truth out for yourself. It's way too complex. You don't have the education. You don't have the background. You don't have the publications and the degrees. Listen to me, because I know. It's interesting because it's like, you know, when Christ came along, he was always railing against the scribes and Pharisees who were hypocrites and who weren't really uh, sincerely interested in truth. They were more interested in power and, and, and position. And 
you know, they had, they had sort of lost the original purity uh, of their own tradition. And you're kind of saying the same thing about science. When I, when I hear you describe the, them that way, it's like these people aren't interested in knowing what's real. What's real. They, they aren't interested in knowing what's ultimately true. They're just playing games, as you said. They're, they're kind of jockeying for status and, and wealth and various you know, per, perks of their, of their position. Well, when I say playing games, I don't mean necessarily just status and wealth and all these you know, this, this negative things. I, but it can be honest, healthy game playing, but it becomes unhealthy if you replace reality with game playing, if you think that your game is actually the reality of things. Well, you can um, also spend half a career investing in a particular paradigm, and then you feel very threatened. There you go. If, if that paradigm begins to be threatened by something, you don't want to just drop it. You know, you, there you go. Yeah. But, but I think, you see, my own experience in science, and I have been in the greatest bastions of science, is that scientists, by and large, are honest. They are not bad people. They don't have bad intent. They are doing all this thinking that they are doing the right thing. Hmm. So I, I don't mean to imply that this is malicious. This isn't malicious. It's just human being stuff, garden variety psychology, you know, yeah. with its weaknesses and its, you know, its, its traps. And uh, scientists are just human beings, very smart human beings at playing that, those games. But uh, that smartness doesn't necessarily uh, correlate with uh, wisdom uh, uh, and introspective insight. Yeah. And often, often it doesn't. Well, it strikes me that it, it's a symptom of, um, you know, egotism, of, of being fixated or, or absorbed in one's individual ego, as opposed to being willing to surrender or relinquish that, which ultimately is what you have to do if, if you really want truth. You know, you have to, kind of the drop has to dissolve into the ocean to, to understand the ocean. Yeah, this idea of surrender, uh, it, this is not in the map of science. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it does not exist. They have, this is really beyond their, their conception of reality. That, that's not what, yeah. what happens in scientific circles. <laughs> which is, again, a point that is, if we're talking about a future scenario in which science and spirituality have each blossomed fully and are collaborating with one another, hopefully they will each have adopted the best of the others um, systems, you know, so that spiritual people will be very systematic and scientific in their explanation, explorations, not given to, to fanc fanciful imaginings. And science, you know, will be uh, kind of very humble and open to uh, truth wherever it may, yeah. it may be found or wherever they may, they may be led uh, without being kind of rigid or invested in, in uh, paradigms that are no longer working. I, I think you make an important point. Uh, all the critiques we've just leveraged at, at science, we can leverage analogous critiques at spirituality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe worse. Maybe worse. Mm -hmm. But uh, since, since I feel I know more of science than of spirituality, I will refrain from pounding people that I don't know sufficiently about. <laughs> I kind of think they need each other, you know? And, you know, at one point, so-called spirituality had the upper hand, and now science has, so-called science has the upper hand, but neither was really all it ought to be. And, and that if they can somehow move beyond the current stage to the point where both are, are com coming to their full potential, and, and by sharing with one another the best uh, aspects of each, then both will become much more than either ever has been. Absolutely. I think there, there is uh, there's a lot of room for dialogue. I mean, there are things... I can mention one concrete example. Um, if you read Nizargarat and Maharaj, I mean, first you have to get past all the outright contradictions in every page of what he writes because his use of words is so loose and because there is translation and because, you know, there are 30 words in, 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 in India for consciousness and only one in English, so right. they translate everything into consciousness. So there's contradictions all over the place. Yeah. But if you get past all that, he was talking about metacognition, about re-representation and self-reflection uh, already in the 60s and the 70s. And this is something that entered the realm of neuropsychology and neuroscience uh, uh, this century. So Schooler published, I think, a seminal paper in 2002 about this idea of re-representation and metacognition. And uh, only this year there has been some, some influential papers about the fact that the neurocorrelates of reportable experience 
are not the neurocorrelates of experience in itself, because to report an experience is an extra cognitive faculty, a metacognitive faculty, on top of the ability to experience something. So all these things are now being talked about in neuroscience. And Isaac Ganata was talking about it long ago in completely different words. He was saying, he was talking about the I am. Know that you are. That's an appeal to metacognition. He was talking about um, experience that isn't in consciousness or something to that effect. He's talking about non-re-represented experiences. In other words, experiences that are not re-represented at a cogn metacognitive level. But this modern stuff in neuroscience, if you read Musagarata with the knowledge that you have today, you go, damn, through pure introspection, this guy knew all this shit already decades <laughs> ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and millennia ago, people have known it. Yeah. Uh, here's a question uh, that came in from Elizabeth again. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, there is a practice known as deity yoga. Maybe you're familiar with it. In which the practitioner imagines that their body is the body of the deity, their mind is the mind of the deity, and their speech is the speech of the deity. In this way, we invoke and inhabit the energy of an archetype. I've often wondered how this sort of practice relates to the more direct path of Advaita Vedanta. What's your sense of this? I think this resonates a lot with uh, Jungian psychology. Okay, I have a lot to say about this, oh, actually. <laughs> this is a sweet spot uh, for me, and, um, and I feel strongly about this. Um, I think one thing is to know what the ultimate truth is, and that's what Advaita Vedanta uh, uh, tells us. And I think it's very effective at it. Know that at the bottom of everything, there is only consciousness, which is the best English word we have. I mean, we should have more English words to really express. And I don't mean con consciousness as cognition or as metacognition you or like, as self-reflection. Like an ocean, like at the bottom of every wave, there's the ocean. Pure, pure consciousness. Right. So the potential for there being something it is like to be. That would be the, the rigorous definition that, that comes from David Chalmers. You're conscious if there is something it is like to be you. Mm -hmm. So that's the most basic level of consciousness. If there is some quality of experience in you, then you are conscious at that basic level. Like you might, not, you might say that your glass of water is not conscious because there's nothing that it is like to be a glass of water. In, in itself, no. But there is something it is like to be the whole universe, a part of which is the glass of water. Right. So we can, we can put it that way. But, uh, so what Advaita Vedanta is telling us is that at the bottom of everything, in scientific terms, the ontological primitive of all reality, the root of all reality, the speaker whose vibrations is the world we see, the feelings we have and everything, is consciousness itself. And what is consciousness? It is that which experiences. It is that whose excitations are the qualities of experience. That's what Advaita Vedanta tells us. And, and, and you can interpret it in many ways. Like, well, then the rest is just excitations, it's all illusion, or the rest are symbols of this ultimate truth that um, ask for interpretation, ask for engagement. It's interpretation, but Ad 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 Advaita gives us that root level. What the Western approaches, which are highly symbolic, and I discussed this, uh, I think, in chapter four of the book, this myth versus no myth uh, traditions and the pros and cons of each as I see them. What the Western traditions give you is a study of the structure of the illusion, if we can call it an illusion. I will concede that word illusion uh, to, to, to speak to, to Advaitists, which I think are a big part of your audience. So I concede that, yes, it's all illusion, but I emphasize that the illusion is the way the truth expresses itself, because the truth cannot be known directly for the same reason that you can't see your eyes uh, uh, with your eyes, unless you have a mirror. The illusion is the mirror. The illusion is the way what is true projects itself in a way that can be apprehended, cognized, and experienced. So the illusion is the only expression of the truth. But what Advaita is probably not going to give us is how does the illusion arise? What is the structure and dynamics of that illusion? Is it restricted to what we can see with our five senses or does the illusion continue before birth, after death and maybe was there before birth? Are there hierarchical worlds of experience in which some form of individuality is preserved? Are there alternative phenomenal universes, universe of, universes of experience with different patterns and regularities, different laws of physics, if you want to call it? Is there a purpose behind the illusion? Is there a teleology? Is it going somewhere? Is it driving to something? 
Is there a grand meaning? Is it, uh, is it war and peace? Or is it just, just an accident? Or is it just for nothing, just for fun, as uh, uh, Alan Watts uh, used to claim, that this is just for fun, which appealed to his personality, but doesn't appeal to anybody who is driven by meaning, uh, which unfortunately is most people today. Um, so I think the Jungian approach, which is reflected also in this, this Buddhist meditation she's referring to, the play of the archetypes, uh, it, it, it's not looking at what is ultimately true. It's saying, okay, there, there is an ultimate truth, but we don't look at it. We look at, at, at the hierarchical levels of the manifestation of that truth, whatever it may essentially be. And we want to study this structure, this complexity, these patterns of the illusion, because it may be helpful, it may inform our lives in a way that we don't understand today. I think the best approach is to marry the two. And it is a very recent, very strong feeling I have had this week, that if you have only one, you're missing out on something. If you go down this archetypal path, the Gnostic path, the, the Western esotericist path of, uh, of uh, Hermeticism, you know, all these other symbolic currents uh, of, of religious mythology, if we ignore that purely for the sake of what is ultimately true, you find a measure of peace, but you will not engage life because you, you, you need a myth to engage life. You need a narrative to motivate you to really engage with, with, the, with the fact that you are alive in the world. But if you have only that mythology and you're not connected to what is ultimately true, true you are liable to all kinds of detours and, and false shortcuts and delusions uh, and taking things too seriously when ultimately you shouldn't, when they go wrong. So marrying, marrying this two, I think, is very useful. And from that perspective, I think, to answer her question finally, <laughs> directly, I think this meditation in which you play with archetypal figures, I think it can be very useful. Uh, Jung called it active imagination. It's slightly different, but the essence underlying the, the, the approach is the same, the goal is the same. Um, but it's also very dangerous because there are, there are some archetypal forces down there that... Um, it's tricky to be in touch with, but uh, if one feels courageous and adventurous enough and perhaps prepared enough, uh, I think it's uh, worthwhile to do it. I think if it doesn't work, it's harmless, and people might think it's, wor it's working, but actually it's not, so it's harmless. But if it does work and you really embody an archetype, I think you, you raise your eyebrows very high and then you think, oh shit, this is not what I thought it would be. Mm. And, uh, but it, it can be very useful. Well, I think you really have to be in shape if you're going to try climb Everest, and and so there might be paths, you know, of spiritual practice that ooh, not everyone is suitable or qualified for, uh, or without more preparation or something, um, they could be too much for a person, or they may not even be able to practice them. Um, but to your other points, I, you know, in my understanding of things, just that I've gleaned over the years and and doing these interviews, um, you know, there. The idea of a deity is not merely some kind of um, fanciful or imaginative notion. There, there are deities. There are deep, powerful impulses of intelligence that um, help to govern and orchestrate the universe. And some of them have vast jurisdictions, and some of them, you know, more small perhaps. But there are all sorts of things uh, going on that don't ordinarily meet the eye, at least of the average person. They do meet the eye of some people. Some people actually perceive the mechanics of this stuff uh, quite routinely. Um, so I don't know. That might be a bit, a bit of a, a diversion, but uh, you know, the, the, it's just that life is much more incredible and, and mysterious and magical and, and <laughs> multifarious than than we than the vast majority of people realize. Yeah, and connecting with this felt sense of the mystery and the magic, I think that is one of the greatest challenges. And it's a challenge I systematically fail at. And um, because, in a sense... Uh, it's something that one I, grows into and that you may become more successful at as you go along. I, I used to be very successful at it when I was very young. Uh. I was very connected to the sense of mystery and the magic of the world. But the more, and, and that's, that's the trick, you know, the, everything that you succeed on has, has a negative impact. 
the more you think you're understanding what this is all about, the more you lose the connection with that sense of ultimate mystery. And unfortunately, to be effective in what I do, which is to write rigorous philosophy, if you don't have this sense that you're making progress and you're figuring it out, you can't do this. Mm. You can't do it. So it's, it's a sort of a job hazard. You know what I mean? Uh, I should get extra pay for this job hazard. Because uh, uh, maybe if, if you just read what I'm saying, uh, you're not really, you, you get a sense of, oh, yeah, this, this makes sense. But you're not as exposed to the, hard, to the hazard as, as you are when you're actually plowing your way through the jungle and getting this feeling that uh, I'm getting this. I'm, I'm figuring this out. And the more you go down that path, the more you lose contact with the mystery and the magic, and the more gray and, and, and silly uh, life starts to feel. So my personal challenge right now is to continue to do what I do, but not fall in this trap. Yeah. And maintain that, that beginner's mind, maintain, maintain that sense of the unfathomable mystery we are sitting on, right under, in, which is right under our noses. And it's very difficult. I think you can do it. Others have. I mean, you know, I, a lot of people I talk to say that they had this sort of mystical union kind of thing going on when they were very young, and then they lost it as they got into their teen years and began to become educated and, and so on and so forth. And some say they've regained it, some haven't. But, you know, some of the greatest spiritual luminaries of history have been great intellects as well as being great mystics. And, for instance, Shankara himself, you know, wrote these really uh, sophisticated commentaries and and so on and yet uh, so he was a great intellect but at the same time a great realizer of truth so I, I think the two can actually be complementary and, and that you shouldn't feel like you're kind of uh, handicapping yourself with all this all this thinking and writing and so on <laughs> maybe you just need to supplement what you're doing with something else some more meditative practice or something in fact, that, that no, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I envy Swedenborg, who was a scientist, an engineer, an inventor, you know, very respected in the Swedish yes. Academy of Sciences, I think and he was a, yeah. and he had this mind-boggling mystical experiences, and mm -hmm. if, I, if I read his experiences symbolically, uh, it makes all kinds of sense, his idea of the correspondences. I mean, that's deep, it, it, it's, it's fantastically deep, it's symbolic, but fantastically deep. Um, but it, it's difficult these days. It was possible until a couple of hundred years ago. But today there is so much you have to know intellectually mm -hmm. in order to be able to articulate things in a way that will get you heard. Uh, so much, so much you have to know. I mean, I have, I have had an experience very recently. I, I submitted a paper to, to a neuroscience journal, which shall remain unnamed. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and a very kind editor, who, who also shall remain unnamed, uh, wrote me back saying, it's a great paper. It's a fantastic paper, but great ideas. But a lot of it has already been written about. Uh, and there is enough new here to go ahead. But you have to connect all this stuff that has already been written about to, to the previous papers. And it was a mind boggling list. And I thought, shit, you know, this is I'll have to plow through another jungle here of a speciality that's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a computer engineer, not a neuroscientist, <laughs> and, and, and I'm doing it, by the way, I'm doing it. But it illustrates the difficulty uh, today, because you see, I'm approaching things from a holistic perspective, uh, which I think is what's needed today. Uh, introspection and science at multiple levels. Science in terms, of, in terms of neuroscience, in terms of psychology, in terms of and, and philosophy of mind, hardcore analytic neurophilosophy as well. So I think when you put it all together, then you have a picture of what's going on. Because these things are not separate. We separated them for our own ease. You know, it makes it easier for us to separate things. But reality is not separate. There is no neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy of mind in reality. There is only reality. So in trying to sew these things all together in a coherent narrative, you get exposed to so much that you have to know constantly. It never ends that um, it's very difficult to see how, how you can be complete, uh, even on the spiritual side and the introspective side uh, of things. Uh, something, something will fall through the cracks. Uh, but, uh, no, anyway, when we knew less, this was possible. It was possible for Swedenborg. It was possible for Leonardo. You know, this Renaissance, uh, men and women 
who were fantastic uh, characters. But there is so much today, and so much is less knowledge as well, but that you have to know anyway in order to be able to articulate your position. That is very tough. For many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one-pointed. <laughs> it comes from the Gita. But um, think of it in terms of like a wheel with spokes, you know, and you have the hub of the wheel, and then you have all these spokes representing the different branches of knowledge. And um, in, in terms of actual knowledge, you can't really become a master of all the spokes. There just isn't time enough in life. Uh, but you can, using any spoke, get to the hub. And if you're at the hub, then you're at kind of the home of all the spokes, so to speak. So I would suggest that um, consciousness in, in the oceanic sense of it, the self, the, the, you know, one's essential ultimate nature, is the home of all knowledge. And that if you can capture that in your awareness, then you will have the sort of the benefit that would be had were you to somehow explore all the branches of knowledge in Absolutely. detail without actually having to do that. I think, I think for, for your personal realization, all this complexity I'm referring to is unnecessary. Uh, a, a personal realization of the truth can be very simple. I have had my glimpses, so I, 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 I don't live in the truth, but I have had glimpses, mm -hmm. personal, direct, uh, experiential glimpses. And I know it's, it's simple. You can't put it in words. <laughs> you, you don't even try because you know it's completely hopeless, but it is simple. So for, for that personal realization, this forest of complexity and knowledge I'm referring to is unnecessary. But if you want to engage in the cultural dialogue, mm. if you want to engage at the level of words and models and theories and arguments and, and, and be heard and, and God bless, maybe even win, <laughs> uh, then you need to engage the forest because yeah. everybody else is in the forest. But the more you can sort of be grounded at the source of it all, then the more all this other the, the more the, the greater the capacity you have to deal with the complexities without getting lost in them true you know true. you can discard what is what is it sorts necessary. everything out for you yes yes oh, oh that experience i've had I, I i have come across things that i look at and i'm saying this is complete nonsense i i don't need to read this further you right. know what i mean but there is a lot of out there that makes sense there are tiny little glimpses or, or formulations of tiny little aspects of the truth that we blow up tremendously in complexity in order to be rigorous and precise and complete and yeah. so on. Um, so it, it's a tree with many, many, many branches and leaves and you have to go from leaf to leaf uh, in order to argue about it. But you can be at the root of yes. the tree and, and, and not ever have to face the complexity of the leaves and branches. It's unnecessary for your personal experience. Right. And you know, you might spend a lifetime exploring the complexity of certain leaves and branches, whereas if you can be at the root, you might in a moment realize, all right, I don't need to go into all that complexity. I've got the essence of that here at the root. Let's, let's investigate other things. But, but I guess what I, what I just want to emphasize is that having established yourself at the root, there's no harm in exploring all the leaves and branches yeah. as you feel motivated to do so. You won't get lost you, you won't lose the forest for the trees, you know? Yeah, and uh, th this closes a nice circle, so if you, if you don't mind, I, I, I sure. add something. Uh -huh. um, I think from a purely or, or new advice or, or a misinterpreted advice or perspective, if you find yourself at the root, that's the end of it. You're there, you're at the root. You feel the truth. The truth breathes through you. It's part of your inner experience. So there is nothing else. But from a Jungian or a Western esotericist perspective, a hermetic perspective, or a Gnostic perspective, um, a symbolic, uh, uh, the, the, the via positiva, the, the via of symbols, um, you would have an archetype that impels you to leave the root, go to the branches and leaves, and fight a cultural fight. Because that's what your soul wants. And, uh, and I sense this very strongly in me. Um, my personal sense of peace takes a backseat to an, an archetypal drive to influence the cultural dialogue about the nature of reality. Yeah, but what I'm and saying is you can do that without leaving the root, and you'll do it better if you can do it without leaving the root. 
the, the, no, Gita, no, the, the Gita says yoga star kuru karmani, established in yoga, perform action. It doesn't just stay, stay established in union. It says get there, be established there, and then engage in the battle of life. I, I acknowledge that. Not, not that I know how to do it, but I acknowledge <laughs> well, it. <laughs> you, you, you're moving along. Actually, I don't, since we're on a personal note with you, I just want to ask you about something. When, when we were at the Science and Non-Duality Conference and we were doing that talk with Chris Fields, you said something that, I, that troubled me afterwards. You said something about how, with your new understanding of, of the way things work, you, you actually are fearful of death now. And I wonder if you could address that and if, if you've resolved that fear. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, okay, when I, uh, when I... I went to university very early at 17, uh, just completed 17. I was already at university, immersed in, you know, in, the, in the culture of physicalism, materialism. Um, hardcore physics, engineering, computer science and all that. I, I was a materialist by default because I was not thinking about alternatives. I just received materialism as the most plausible alternative. I accepted it. It came from the masters, uh, you know, the teachers, the professors, uh, the Nobel Prize winners, even with, um, with uh, I had contact with some at CERN. And um, I just swallowed it whole. And uh, I had no fear of death, because if you really, most people who proclaim themselves materialists aren't really, if you really, embrace and internalize materialism, you don't fear death because there is literally nothing nothing to fear. I see, because you're, you're just gone when, when you're yeah, gone. But there's nothing there. Right. You know, it's the end of all of your suffering, your problems, your anxieties, your depression. And you, know, you push a button, it's all out, it's off. It's the end of it all. No, it's a ticket to freedom because you, 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 you aren't anymore. So. This wouldn't occupy my mind at all. There's nothing to prepare for. There's nothing to think about. There is literally nothing there, literally. So it's very freeing. Um, and then at some point in my 30s, I realized that, that uh, that's complete nonsense. That's just wishful thinking. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. And it, 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 I realized that once I understood the hard problem of consciousness and I understood the hopelessness uh, of ever trying to explain the qualities of experience from the modeled parameters of, parameters of physical system, which is what I was doing at the time. I was working on artificial intelligence, strong AI for, for physics experiments. Uh, we had this ambition of having a, an artificial intelligence do the data selection during the data acquisition uh, at the LHC, at the Atlas Detector. Uh, ultimately, something, some other approach <laughs> was used. But it, it was what I was doing. I was trying to replicate in a computer mental processes. And I realized that whatever I could replicate would never give rise to the qualities of experience. There's a fundamental gap. And if that was the case, then physicalism didn't add up. And if physicalism doesn't hold, then there's no reason to think consciousness ends upon the end of the body. Because if it's not the body that's generating your consciousness, that the body dies. So what? It's not generating your consciousness anyway. And then what is the ultimate implication? The ultimate implication is then that um, death is not the end of consciousness. Death is a new experience, but one you know nothing about. Now you have an unknown, and that has been the archetypal fear of, uh, of humankind. I mean, the fear of hell, the fear of purgatory, the fear of what will happen after you die, which in, it has built into it the idea that consciousness will continue. You just don't know what will be the next experience. And uh, what we do know, based on, for instance, meditation or the use of psychedelics, which, as it turns out, uh, reduce brain activity, don't increase it. So it's a sort of a simulation of death. You make the first steps towards no brain activity by using psychedelics. Uh, what we know from, from studies and from experience there is that uh, the archetypal forces uh, emerge. And they can be very good. They can be blissful. And, and they can be terrible. You know, there are many deities uh, in the pantheon uh, of, 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 of archetypes. Um, and which deity will come to you when you die? I don't know. And that's my honest answer. And then the refuge would be to really be well-trained in Advaita so that uh, once you die, you know how to step out of your experience and assume the witness position and know that this is just a, an image in the mirror, a symbolic image in a symbolic mirror of, of what you are, 
but that fundamentally you are the one watching the mirror. And the, and, and the image in the mirror can never hurt what you truly are because you're just watching all of your experiences. So I can imagine that this kind of training is useful during that transition, uh, but it doesn't solve the fear. No. Well, in simple terms, though, I know in Eastern traditions and maybe also Western, and Westerns too, Western too, the, the basic myth is that if you live a good life, then whatever happens after you die will be pretty good. So, you know, we, we have control over that pretty much. And uh, maybe we don't need to fear as long as we're, we're doing the best we can in, in, in this life. It's a soothing story, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, we're talking about myths here. In fact, here's, here's a question from Mike in Santa Clara that might be a good point to bring it in. We, we were talking earlier about the train wreck metaphor, and uh, he said, is there a particular myth that can help reduce the existen existential angst for those that, who see the train of materialism heading for catastrophe? Ah, of course. Uh, if, he, if he is actually referring to existentialism, so the existential angst as described by... by um, he uh, might also part. mean like, you know, what we see with climate change and various other things happening in the world that, you know, we could end up, you know, going to hell in a handbasket if we yeah. don't yeah, turn but, things around. I understand that the expression existential angst is Kierkegaardian, so I, I will reply on, 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 on that assumption that, that that's what he means. Okay. Like, um, the existential angst comes to you only to the extent that you see yourself as smaller than the world and inserted in the world, and the world being separate from you. Only then is the world oppressive, out of control, threatening, and, and only then um, can the world also be finite. Um, and, and the train wreck, a, a permanent thing that, that actually threatens you. Um, I think all legitimate religious myths uh, can help one overcome this existential angst. Uh, they all talk about uh, the kinship, the essential fundamental kinship between humans and God. Jesus was fully man and Jesus was fully God. And the Holy Spirit has descended to every man, woman and child. Uh, uh, on, on this planet. So this fundamental kinship, this identity between man and God, God as the one that encompasses the world, and man as the one who is encompassed by the world, if this difference collapses through this kinship, existential angst goes out of the window. Because then, you know, what if there is a train wreck? What if there is catastrophe and this planet goes up in flames? It's an event in time. And we live in eternity. We, we are ground in, in eternity. It will be part of the romance. It will be part of war and peace. It will be a tragedy in war and peace. And many new romances will, will emerge after that tragedy. New planets. Maybe the Earth will come back online uh, after a few thousand years. We cannot destroy the planet. We can only destroy our means to survive in the planet. The planet itself will always uh, recover, given sufficient millions of years uh, into the future. We can only destroy ourselves as a species. And, but then what does it matter? Yeah. What does it matter if you don't see yourself as the one inserted in the planet, but as the one imagining the planet and the whole thing that is happening in it? I think that's a good answer. And I mean, even the planet won't survive eventually. The, the sun is going to become a red giant and the, the, the earth will become engulfed in it and melted and so on. But we won't. Five billion years. Yeah, that's, that's about it. That's smoke. about the timeline. Yeah, <laughs> uh, at, at that point, the global warming skeptics will finally have to admit we have a problem. Um, <laughs> but that won't perturb the self. You know, the, it will not. The, the, the for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, maybe that's a good point to end on. I'm sure there's tons of points in your book here and even on this summary of your book that I have in front of me that we could discuss and haven't discussed, but these interviews always have to be sort of a little taste, you know, a, a teaser. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if people like what they hear, then, then they can read the book. And um, I've, it's interesting, there's a fellow named Jeffrey Kripal that I interviewed a couple of years ago along with Dana Sawyer. And, uh, I noticed that Jeffrey discovered you and, and kind of did a crash course in reading all your books and wrote a very <laughs> beautiful introduction to the current one. And uh, 
we've met a few weeks back uh, in, oh, good. in Virginia. Great. Yeah. He's a very nice guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in any case, I think that endorsement says something. There's, I always find it a little bit of a, a challenge and a stretch to read your material and even to talk to you but it, 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 because you're so brilliant, but it, it makes me more intelligent by having to <clears throat> expand my capacity in order to understand what you're talking about. So, <laughs> uh, so I really appreciate it, actually. And I highly encourage you know, those who have found this conversation interesting. And there have been a record number of people online during it, over well over 100 at most times, to um, check out some of your writings. And um, I think, I think one it. thing we didn't cover, and, and, and I'm not suggesting that we cover it now, but uh, ju just, just to mention it uh, so, so people know, I think part two of the book where I talk about space and time and the fact that they don't exist and how we can figure it out through pure introspection without any scientific knowledge or scientific experiments purely by introspecting we can we can feel and realize that space and time are not there and 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 the idea of the cosmic big bang how do we create space and time in our own minds through circular uh, cognition i think that that's that that could be attractive to advaita inclined people because it resonates so well with advaita it's difficult to talk about it's very difficult to write about but at least you have more time to to sort of craft your words when you're writing, which is much more difficult to do when you're talking. Uh, so it, maybe it, it, it's even good that we didn't talk about that, but I just wanted to leave it out there, put it out there, that this is in the book and, uh, and it can be interesting. Great. Well, P.T. Barnum said, always leave them wanting more. So there's a little, uh, a little temp temptation for the people. <laughs> All right. Well, let me just uh, make some concluding remarks. I've been speaking with Bernardo Castrop, which has really been enjoyable for me and hopefully for all of you who've been listening to us all this time. Um, this, uh, I'll be creating a page for this interview on batgap.com and linking to all of Bernardo's books and his website and all that. Um, y you have a podcast also, I believe. And uh, are you keeping up with that, the podcast? Or? Uh, not really, not really. It's, yeah. it's really incidental. <laughs> okay, okay, so we won't worry about that too much. Um, and this uh, interview, as I said in the beginning, as most of you know, is, is part of an ongoing series. Uh, we'll be continuing with a new one every week. Um, so if you would like to be notified of new ones, you can either subscribe on YouTube and YouTube will notify you, or you can subscribe on, uh, on BatGap. Uh, and I'll, uh, Bat, you know, you'll get an email once a week every time a new one is posted. Um, what else is going on? There's an audio podcast of the whole thing, uh, if you prefer to listen in that format rather than watch. Um, there's the donate button, which I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and a bunch of other things. If you just poke around the menus on the website, you'll, you'll f see what we have to offer. So thanks for listening or watching. And thank you again, Bernardo. It's really been a joy. And uh, hope to see you again at SAN Conference or someplace. It's sure. <laughs> Always fun to talk to you, Rick. It was yeah, a pleasure. It was a pleasure. And uh, those who are listening or watching, see you next week.